Hello uh, and welcome. Uh, this is Keith Kreischer, Executive Director of the IoT Entim Council. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this third panel discussion of our day, covering the topic of VTX Communications. This panel is part of the IoT Infrastructure Conference, a CES partner program presented by the IMC and sponsored by Digi International, Core, and Software AG. We thank our sponsors for making this online event possible. Uh, we also thank you, our audience, for being here and hope that everyone is staying safe and well in these uh, uh, interesting but difficult times. Uh, you can see the full schedule for today's session in the resource section of your interface. Uh, for this panel, we welcome participation from uh, Matt Hatton of Transforma Insights, Syed Z. Hossein of Ares Communications, Stefania Sessia of Ublox, Nathan Wade from Digi International, and William Yan from AV System. Uh, you can see the full speaker bios at the right-hand side of your uh, slide deck. Before we begin, we did want to go over a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets that you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area to maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrow in a box at the right hand top right corner of that dashboard. Uh, the webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer, speakers, or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presenter. If your slides are delayed, pushing the F5 button on your keyboard will refresh the page. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of this webcast will be available later today and can be accessed using the same audience link sent to you earlier. If you have any questions during the webcast, and we do encourage questions, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. The presenters may answer the questions at the end of the session, but please, but please feel free to ask questions at any time during this presentation. Any unanswered questions will be responded to offline. Uh, a quick word about the IMC. Uh, we are the world's largest community of qualified enterprise users and product makers that deploy IoT solutions. So whether you're a solutions provider or an adopter, I recommend that you join the IMC and take a leadership role in the IoT sector. You can find us at iotm2mcouncil.org. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of this panel discussion, Matt Hatton, uh, a founder of Transforma Insights. Matt, good morning, welcome, and take us away. Hi, Keith. Thank you very much for that handover. Uh, so yes, as Keith said, I'm Matt Hatton. I'm one of the founding partners at Transformer Insights. We're a new analyst firm, but founded by some analyst veterans focused on helping enterprises understand the impact of disruptive technologies and helping vendors to better serve the demands of the market. Today's session is going to be looking at V2X and the future of the connected car. Now, connected cars is nothing new. Uh, I was just checking today, GM's OnStar is 25 years old this year, and, and companies have been using fleet management solutions for decades. But it does seem like the pace of change has accelerated somewhat. Uh, not only is it now standard practice for vehicles to roll off the production lines with connectivity baked in, we're also seeing V2X starting to arrive, and alongside that, and interrelated with it, we see the rise of autonomous vehicles. So the cars hit the technology headlines in the last few years in a way that it hasn't for years, and particularly the electric car. Tesla's now not only the most valuable car manufacturer in the world, but it's more valuable than the next nine biggest put together. Crazy. But we're only just scratching the surface of the impact of the electric car. Soon every household is going to have a, a whopping great battery sitting on their driveway outside, which utilities will use for load balancing across the network. We also have a change ongoing in the way that cars are owned, shared ownership models are on the rise and so forth. So I, I think I've made my point. The automotive sector is sexy again, but at the same time, it's massively challenged. 2020 sent car purchases through the floor. So exciting times, but not without their challenges. Some of those topics that I've mentioned will, I'm sure, be amongst those that the panelists will address. The format for today's panel will be as follows. First, we're going to have the panelists introduce themselves and make a few opening statements about how they see the connected cars and V2X space. 
Then I've got a set of pre-prepared questions which I'll want to run through. Uh, then with about 20 minutes or so to go, I'll open it up to Q&A from the audience. So do get your thinking caps on. Uh, listen to, to what all of these, uh, these uh, experts are saying and come up with some questions that you'd like to put to our esteemed speakers. And speak, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Our first is Z Hussain, the CTO of Eris Communications. Z, over to you. Thank you very much, Matt. I'd like to get started by just giving you a quick one slider on our company, uh, who we are and what we do. We've been providing IoT solutions for more than two decades. I'm, in fact, one of the founders of the company, and we've been around for 25 plus years at this point. We have a global footprint. Uh, offices around the world offering services for IoT solutions for customers soup to nuts from the connectivity all the way through the analytics engines that uh, we provide for analysis for the data. Uh, right now, as we can support services in over 180 different countries, obviously we don't have units in every country, but uh, last time I looked about two or three months ago, we had uh, units registering in about 160 countries, which is pretty impressive, and we enjoy supporting our customers in those applications. Broad variety of markets. Not surprisingly, automotive is our biggest. In terms of the numbers, I'm not going to go through each one of those in detail, but we have over 15 million units deployed, and well over 60% of those are automotive and fleet. Uh, maybe even 65% of those are automotive and fleet, because what we do with cellular IoT is a natural for that market. Uh, we've been doing this for a number of years, lots of experience, literally hundreds of millions of years of operating device experience. Uh, at this point, the ability for us to provide services to a customer uniformly around the world is something that we have developed a uh, good following of customers who, have, who are using that. And we're quite uh, pleased that we have multinationals who have got, multi, uh, got you know, units deployed in more than just one country. Naturally, since we started in the United States and then evolved into Europe and the rest of the world, uh, a large majority of those units are uh, in those two major regions, the US and Europe. So let me, without any further ado, dive into it, uh, the details but if anyone has any questions uh, about who we are, what we do, et cetera, uh, right now being the, the third largest in terms of the automotive sectors in the United States in terms of units deployed and in the top 10 around the world, we feel we have a fair amount of experience with providing these kinds of services to the automotive industry. Now, I warned Matt that I'm going to play a minor bit of a contrarian role, and I'm going to start, away, start right away with the takeaway. V2X will happen but everyone's expectations of how long it's gonna take um, is just not gonna be met. I think it's gonna take far longer than, than you would expect. So let's, let me dive right in. I think that's, you know, this is sort of some of the super easy uh, kind of statements that someone might make, which is that I think that some of the V2X elements will deploy sooner. Vehicle to vehicle, for inner vehicle communication, although it's still in design, it's certainly gonna happen quicker because there are fewer pay players involved. I still warn people about uh, the fact that this has been around for a long, long time, and we've had connected cars for a long time, but let's look at how long DSRC has been worked on. The, the FCC allocated spectrum for DSRC back in 1999. That was 21 plus years ago. And yet you have you yet to see major deployments of any kind, let alone uh, you know widespread commercial use of the technology. Uh, I think the other issues that has been uh, a concern of mine is that V2I may take a lot longer simply because it needs public funding. And in these post-COVID-19 times where we have governments who are stretched to the limit with the amount of money they have, we're simply not going to see infrastructure deployment uh, for potentially a couple of decades, in my opinion. And so we'll see how long it takes to really get there. Uh, and in terms of other smart objects in motion, it, they're happening. You're starting to see smart bicycles. You're starting to see people uh, carrying, uh, you know, potentially being uh, involved in the V2X and V2I space where uh, in, in the cities in particular, you're going to watch um, how vehicles can perhaps avoid people. But I think all of that using V2X technology is just simply going to take a lot longer than we'd expect. If you look back, in terms of what has been done uh, for connected cars and um, what's happening in the AV world, the, the question that I have is when will connected cars really be the majority of the vehicles that are sold around the world by all of the OEMs in all markets? A couple of years ago, there was an estimate done, and I think back in 2019, the estimate was about just under 30 million cars were shipped with um, uh, 
embedded telematics of some sort, not P2X, but embedded telematics of some sort. And the expectation was that that was going to grow to about 75 million by 2024. And uh, there have been predictions by other uh, analyst firms that by 2025, you'll start to see some V2X use in play. Maybe about 11 million or so of the cars that will be shipped that year will contain a V2X solution of some kind, maybe V2E probably. That will be, the majority of those will be in, in China. 40% of those, perhaps, maybe even 50%, 25% in Europe, and the rest of the world uh, will, will handle the rest of those shipments. But let's keep in mind that we have over a billion cars in use today around the world. So it's going to take a long time before the penetration of these cars, um, whether it's connected vehicles or level four, level five AV, really get delivered. Pretty much all of the level four and five uh, systems that I know about are in development. Uh, you know, level four systems are in development in, in various proof of concept phases. So we'll, we'll see when it starts becoming a majority of the vehicles that are available. My concern, which I've raised before, is that I'm, I think people who buy some of these uh, level four autonomous vehicles and even the high end connected cars that have cruise control, automated cruise control, lane, lane handling systems, systems today could cause a, a transition problem where you're sharing roads between AV and non-AV vehicles where people have expectations about what their AV vehicle can do and what non-AV vehicles cannot do. And then you might have a situation where the purpose and goal of increasing safety will actually decrease for a while. And that's that's a concern that we have to really be careful about because it's going to get a lot of media attention and it's going to cause some backlash among people who don't understand what it's going to evolve to in time. So, you know, I would like to make sure that while I have been a little bit pessimistic about the time frames, I'm still an op optimist. I do believe it's a question of when. Uh, sorry, it's a question of if, not a question of when is, all of this is going to happen. But we have to be careful. We need to define what we mean by the future. Are we talking about the numbers of vehicles deployed? Are we talking about accident rate deduction, uh, reduction? Are we talking about being able to successfully reduce fatalities? I mean, let's, let's keep in mind that in the United States from 1960 onwards, we've seen a factor of five reduction in fatalities on the per passenger mile driven simply because of the improvements and safety that have taken place even before V2X started to happen. So I think, you know, there's evolution happening. It's going to happen. It's a question of if. This question of when. I'm going to be a little bit of a pe pessimist and say that the majority of V2X connected cars is simply not going to happen for at least 10, 15, possibly 20 years if we are if we don't take care and we don't worry about uh, making some of the uh, changes happen sooner, some of the decision points happen sooner. For example, there's a little bit of a struggle going on between whether it will be DSRC or it will be CV2X. I think that those decisions need to be solved quickly. I'm concerned about the fact that the FCC back in November of 2020 kind of took away some of the uh, spectrum from DSRC and said they're going to allocate it to the ISM bands and they're going to allocated to other technologies such as CV2X because of a lack of adoption of DSRC. That we have to watch out for. We have to make sure that we have plans in place, solve the uh, technical and business issues of going forward and make it happen. So I'm an optimist in that sense. Great stuff. Thank, thanks, Z. Um, okay, uh, now, as long as you can keep that contrarian thread going, that will be good for our, <laughs> uh, our panel discussion later on. Uh, next up, uh, Stefania Sessia, who is the uh, global head of app marketing in the uh, automotive at Ublox. Uh, Stefania, over to you. Yeah, hi, hello, everybody. Um, so first of all, let me introduce uh, uh, briefly uh, Ublox. Ublox is a company of above um, 1,000 employees with um, approximately 70% uh, into the R&D. And actually, we invest above more than 20% actually yeah, of our revenues into the R&D. Uh, so it's, highly, it's a company that is highly driven by the innovation. Um, we uh, serve mainly three um, domains. Um, we serve the automotive, the industrial, and also the consumer. Uh, Ublox, actually, uh, the business, the main business of Ublox is on uh, um, four uh, sectors on positioning systems, where we are leader with several products related on uh, standard positioning system, high precision positioning systems. 
uh, we have a cellular connectivity solution, uh, mainly on the um, uh, IoT domain, and we have also short-range uh, type of connectivity. And uh, as an overall, we also cover the market with uh, our services. Uh, we have uh, chip level solutions as well as module uh, solutions. Uh, we have a global presence um, with um, covering approximately 29 locations. Um, about myself, our senior director, head of global application marketing for uh, the automotive for U blocks. Um, so I wanted to highlight a couple of items. Uh, probably some of them are um, similar to uh, what the pre previous speaker mentioned. The first thing is that the vehicular communication exists already since several time, probably under different forms in the past, but it evolves. For sure, it becomes less noisy. We are facing a transformation from a vehicle that offers a pipe for the, for the user to communicate uh, to a vehicle that creates data itself uh, autonomously and share this data with the other entities into the uh, into the system. So basically, we are moving from a pure infotainment type of use case to uh, uh, use cases like uh, uh, helping the ADAS system, uh, helping and improving the safety. So the basic question is, uh, when are we going to see really this transformation, this fundamental transform transformation happening into the market? We believe that uh, in order to get good benefits of this type of technology, there is really the need to have a certain level of penetration into the market, both from um, different type of communication technology, short range and the long range type of technology and service availability. So the, the question that was raised also before is what are the main drivers? And indeed, in several years, actually, the technology didn't really fly, was not really deployed into the market um, massively, I would say. Um, so what are the main drivers and why uh, these might happen in the next uh, years, actually? Last uh, point that I wanted to make is that uh, today in the market we see some deployments of the technology uh, mainly to inform the users about uh, uh, danger, but we believe that um, uh, a large amount of benefit of this technology comes whenever the communication can be used in order to um, uh, somehow bias the way the decision is taken in the uh, um, autonomous vehicle or the assisted vehicle. So the last point that I wanted to raise is uh, what is the path to go there and what are the challenges uh, that we need to face in order to go there and we need to, to, to face in order to uh, use the connectivity and move forward with uh, the use of the connectivity uh, into the autonomous vehicle. And having said that, I uh, give it back to you, Matt. Thank you very much, Stefania. Next speaker is Nathan Wade of Digi. Nathan, over to you. Thanks, Matt. And thank you, everyone, for joining this session today. Go ahead and get the slide moved here. Uh, so who is Digi International? Uh, I think Digi might be the old guard here today. Uh, we were founded in 1985, have been public since 1994. Hopefully my information will show up here so you can see it. Uh, there we go. Great. A pioneer in wireless communication since that time. We started uh, as a company known as DigiBoard. Uh, we started by connecting serial ports to um, to embedded boards and, and really grew from there. We've grown into an Im embedded module and gateway manufacturer. Uh, we manufacture cellular routers and networking devices as well. Uh, we provide IoT software and services, including a management platform that operates uh, and controls all of our devices that we manufacture. Uh, we are now a leader in security around IoT devices, which has obviously been vastly, vastly important over the last few years. Um, in the last few years, we've developed a smart sense application that allows for temperature monitoring along with additional IoT functionality. Um, we've been really innovative and uh, important in, in, in COVID-19 relief. Uh, we've developed a, a temperature monitoring solution uh, to help for with uh, immediate uh, identification of fevers in, in people. And, and really, it's a total um, 
R&D and engineering team that's able to design and develop and deploy uh, solutions across many, many industries and, and, and with many different capabilities to the point where we have a design services team that can help other com companies develop and deploy solutions within similar industries. And a lot of the focus that we've, we've uh, worked on recently is in the smart city transportation and in energy and industrial um, industries. So we, we have a lot of experience in, in, in traffic, in, in V2I, in V2X now, uh, from a module standpoint, all the way to the back end, um, the back end infrastructure. Uh, to introduce myself a little bit, I am the regional sales manager for public sector um, for Digi in the Americas. Um, and so I really operate kind of boots on the ground uh, within Digi. I work with agencies on a daily basis. We talk about the issues that they have, uh, the complications that they have, and, and how to solve those, uh, whether that's from an embedded standpoint uh, with an integrator partner, all the way through to a box product that might uh, allow uh, the advancement or uh, expansion of their, their infrastructure. And to move into um, what, what Digi provides to the VTX, V2X world, uh, I, I wanna mention first that I thought Z was spot on with his assessment of, of V2X, where it's at now, where it's going. And I want to uh, uh, ditto to in, in regards to the infrastructure piece, the V2I. Uh, it does need to be publicly funded. And one of the biggest uh, concerns I see in regards to V2X <coughs> is is the whether or not it, communications is actually ubiquitous within public within the public domain. Um, from my experience, I found most agencies are between 0% and 75% connected. Uh, no, very, very few agencies out there actually have true 100% connectivity within the area of their control. And that's gonna be very, very difficult to overcome if we want to actually deploy true V2X across entire regions. Um, and Digi's really focused on resolving that solution or that, that issue, I should say. Uh, we have XB's very, very small um, footprint devices that are connected via cellular that allow for connectivity to um, traffic intersection cabinets, to variable message signs and message boards, to RFID readers for HOV lanes, et cetera. Uh, we have embedded modules that can be placed inside the vehicles for connectivity, either vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, um, et cetera. And where we've really expanded and seen a lot of success is with cellular box products. Um, wired communications are not, are not going to resolve that ubiquity of communications issue that we're dealing with. Uh, it's too expensive. It's too disruptive. It's too difficult to run wired communications to every intersection, to every asset, to every location that exists in an agency's region. And so as a result, we have to find some way to bolster that communications. If we're not at 100% communications in a region, we will not be able to successfully deploy V2X solutions. And that's where I really believe cellular and, and private cellular are going to come in and make a very huge in communication. Um, this was just recently released uh, a few weeks ago, but previously uh, in 2019, Digi was actually recognized along with New York City DOT for their infrastructure award, uh, infrastructure deployment of the year award around technology. Uh, we deployed cellular communications to every single infra intersection in all uh, five boroughs of New York. And we gave, we helped New York achieve true uh, ubiquitous communication citywide. With that, they're able to connect to all their CCTV cameras. They're able to connect and communicate with every one of their, uh, their intersections. And they've been able to deploy um, traffic density monitoring, traffic determination studies, true V to X or V to 
AI type applications that are running and operating today successfully. So with cellular technology, with the expansion of 4G LTE, and now the evolution of 5G, we have the ability to truly get to a ubiquitous communications network for the V2X uh, applications that are going to, 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 to be deployed um, now and in the future. And, and that's really what I'm most excited about. And I think once we're able to get to that point where the communication backbone is there, where the infrastructure is there, then, then the rest of it will, will fall into place. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Nathan. Um, our final speaker, last but not least, um, I'm delighted to, to welcome William Yan, who is the President Americas at AV Systems. Uh, William, over to you for your opening remarks. Thanks, Matt. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you. Good day. And thank you for joining us. My name is William Yan. I'm with AV System here in Boston. Uh, a few words about AV System. And uh, I'm a little bit of a contrarian uh, on this panel. So we don't make any hardware, and uh, we are all about software. Software is hot. Software is what this uh, V2X is all about. And uh, so we are hot. AV System is a 15-year-old software company. We provide IoT device management and data management software platform to service providers, that's your communication carriers, to enterprises directly, to OEMs, such as Digi, OEMs of module providers, sensor manufacturers, device integrators. We manage the life cycle of devices from uh, bootstrapping authentication of the device to uh, onboarding, performing updates, patches, configuration changes, uh, to ongoing monitoring and uh, diagnostics. Uh, there are probably uh, multiple, uh, lots of points can be made about connected vehicles, connected cars, connected fleet. I'm just going to highlight my point of view in three areas. One is the state. I echo what Z mentioned, the first speaker mentioned, in terms of where we are. And the consumers and the business are starting to embrace uh, the benefits of connectedness for safety, infotainment, for maintenance. So uh, there are concerns of security, your privacy, and reliability. Technology platform providers and automotive OEMs are really looking at multi-billion dollar opportunities coming at us. But on the other hand, fully autonomous, either you look at it as four levels or five levels, is still a long way to go. And uh, 5G has a lot of promises. I also echo the sentiment. Cellular is uh, the way to go for its performance. Uh, the pieces are folding together, but is there's a, a lot of ways to go. If we talk about autonomous driving, or autonomous being self-control, self-correcting, self-healing, uh, executing commands in real time, a uh, vehicle is really becoming a giant computer, if you look at it. It's a giant computer on the move. Uh, what's, uh, what we have now is the injecting the cognitive capability. Uh, the machine is going to make a decision for you. The machine is driving itself intelligently. So we're talking about intelligent mobility management, real-time, coordinated, uh, of uh, all these within all these environments. But key to the success of uh, uh, connected cars, or autonomous driving, is truly about building the ecosystem. It's about standardization uh, from connectivity, communication systems to management, ongoing management uh, platforms. Over the air, uh, we're going to get into it in more detail later on on this panel uh, about you know security patches, firmware updates. These are fundamentals to the success of uh, a connected vehicle autonomous driving because it's all about in real time, these systems, communication systems, the automotive systems are updated, updated for ongoing monitoring diagnostics. 
So that's the key point I'm going to make highlight here and I'll hand back to Matt. Brilliant. Thank you, Will. There's a few th themes that came up in common across uh, several of those opening comments. There's also some great questions coming in, by the way, but um, I've got the um, I've got the mic for a, for a few minutes now and I've got a, a few questions, a few areas that I want to talk about. First one is about OK, listening to you guys talk and Stefania, I'm going to come to you on this for this one first. It, it sounds like I, I'm kind of hearing without hearing uh, the word tipping or the term tipping point. Um, is, is there a tipping point for a lot of these things to to, to really start to be uh, viable, particularly around V2X? And what's the dependency? What are we waiting for? I, I, I'd like to dig into that a little bit if we can. So, yeah, sure. I mean, um, I think that there are uh, um, one of the, the questions that was raised by many uh, by many people is really when this technology will uh, will happen into the uh, into the market and what are the key drivers that will drive really the definition and the, the deployment of this uh, of this technology? Because as mentioned at the end, this technology was on the market since, or was available from a technology point of view, from a standardization point of view, was available on the market since uh, many years i would say uh, but never really massively uh, deployed right so um, i think that um, uh, there were there are probably many things that um, uh, need to be considered and prob probably the connectivity first of all was not highly deployed uh, into uh, into the vehicle uh, while it it's probably growing now, um, even though probably not at the rate we wanted, but still it is growing. Uh, second, I think that there is also a return of investment problem, right? If you don't have the right penetration of those uh, uh, of those technology, all of a sudden, all together, then you have a problem of a return of investment. Because if you are the only one mm -hmm. deploying those technologies, then you don't get necessarily all the benefit if you don't meet any other customer or any other vehicles that are connected with your this technology or any other infrastructure connected with this technology. Uh, there are, there has been also confusion because of the different uh, technology and different competing technologies in the in the market that um, uh, were um, somehow uh, creating ambiguity. I would say uh, now it seems that uh, in different regions uh, probably the situation becomes a little bit more clear and. Uh, what is also important to mention is that there are some drivers that might come in the in the next few years, and in particular NCAP as a driver, that might come in the next few years in 2024, 2025, that could be really this booster in order to, to drive the penetration of this uh, technology. Mm, OK. So a lot of it's going to be regulatory. That, that, that's uh, interesting. Um, Z, if I can come to you on the on similar sort of, sort of question. Um, as a as a contrarian as you are, um, <laughs> there, is there always a risk of this evolution between generations, or is this is there something very specific about this in 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 terms of the the connected car, the um, the autonomous car, this this um, evolution that we've got to got to go through? I mean, you, you talked about the differences, you know, vehicles having to cope with the fact that other vehicles aren't connected and and you've got you know is, is there a fundamental mismatch there that means that this thing is is really going to be pushed out by decades and decades it it could happen let me let me i think one of the um, comments you made and i think stefania echoed this as well is there is there are some few tipping points that are occurring number one uh, and some tipping points that need to occur for example and here's my contrarian view slightly we all have an expectation of what 5g will do to the connected car space and it will perform i think in ways that um, we have not seen yet but a lot of the functionality that is in the connected car today can be perfectly well served by 4G. Now, there's the point. We have seen a transition occurring. The connected cars in the United States, particularly the ones that were deployed 25 years ago, for example, by OnStar, were in the analog AM stays. They had to trans transition to the CDMA world because that was their next technology of choice. And now they have gone into the LTE world. The majority of the cars that are being deployed today in the connected car space, which is still a small fraction, um, is LTE. And we're going to see 5G coming on. So that transition and change in the cellular world has caused some ripple effects 
in every IoT application and in the connected car world. Fortunately, you're not going to see these connected cars hang around for you know 50 years on the road, most likely. But the point is that that transition of technology is an issue. So 5G should give us some breathing room for a long, long time. And as long as we set our expectations correctly about what it's capable of doing for the connected car space. Now, you know, we have, as Stefania also mentioned, we have this little bit of a dis discussion going on as to whether DSRC is better or CV2X is better, and you have camps on both sides. Uh, they, you know, existing companies have chosen to go with DSRC in some cases, and then there are organizations and other existing companies are going with CV2X. That decision point needs to be the next tipping point. We need to make a decision on which one it is and go forward. Now, the V2V will happen sooner simply because they're far fewer players involved, as I mentioned. You have the automotive guys who have to deal with that. Uh, and there has to be a lot of interaction between the automotive guys for the standards to get settled out and make sure everyone is interoperating, interoperating correctly. So the decades are still real, uh, in particular for V2I. And Nathan was absolutely spot on that there have been lots of deployments in, in certain areas, but those are still tiny. And, and the transition from a car that has the expectation of support from a V2I in infrastructure inside a major city is different from what it might uh, do when it's outside that major city. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm also going to take one more strange contrarian point, which I want to emphasize that we have seen a transition going on from lots of cars on the road to fewer cars in the next generation of uh, people. Okay. My son, for example, loves driving, but I will also say the following thing. In the past 10 months, where I used to drive about 20,000 miles a year, I put less than 2,500 miles in my car because I'm working from home. My wife's car has been less than 1,000 miles over a 10-month period. My son, who used to drive back and forth from his college in Southern California, sort of a 600-mile, 700-mile round trip, has put less than 600 miles on his car in the past 10 months since he's been home. That change is something that the automotive guys are frankly struggling with and is going to continue to happen. So it actually is a positive note for AV because I think that's going to help you know, particularly in sort of the uh, the the um, public transport markets, but the AV mm -hmm. for consumer space, which is the large majority of the units being deployed today, may get impacted a little bit more, and that's a concern. Yeah, maybe time now, for if I may jump. If I may yeah, jump in on this point to your question, in terms of uh, you know technology evolution, right? That which exists in any and in every industry. So your question was, is there anything unique in this connected cars, autonomous driving industry uh, business? I think there is. If you look at it, the uh, DSRC versus the Wi-Fi versus the uh, cellular-based uh, V2X, uh, uh, they're not compatible. So there is a, a uh, you have to make a decision. You have to make a choice. And... Mm -hmm. uh, I see this, uh, the cellular, the benefit of the cellular, especially 5G. But right now the challenge is, it's almost a chicken egg thing, right? The biggest use case, arguably, is uh, for, for, for 5G Problem. is connected to cars. Connected to cars well, means 5G for, for a second, you now. Yeah, I was saying, you know, a uh, driver for for 5G is the uh, connected cars. On the other hand, the uh, connected cars need 5G to uh, to fully enable its capabilities. It's a chicken egg thing, but we have to make a decision, and uh, it, because they're simply not compatible. If I may jump in, uh, probably Matt, just to make a comment, uh, is that the fundamental difference between, uh, at the end, we, we are trying to, to consider the, the vehicle as a smartphone somehow, and to apply very similar technology in a vehicle and in a smartphone. And the main difference between the two is the life, lifetime, right? Because the telephone, you change mm -hmm. your telephone every couple of years, so you can follow new releases, you can follow how the technology evolves. Of course, you need to have backward compatibility, but you need to follow, you, you can follow pretty easily how the 
technology evolves. A vehicle, whenever mm. you put the vehicle into the system, it needs to stay into the system and operable and up to date for more than 10 years or even more. So it's not only a problem of, um, uh, of software, and maybe there are some components of the software that can be upgraded, but there is also hardware that has to be provisioned into the, uh, into the vehicle. And this is probably a main, uh, one of the main difficulties actually um, today in the autonomous, uh, uh, in the connected uh, vehicle shape. Mm. We, we will come back to that. Um, but, but in the meantime, um, Nathan, I wanted to come to you on this. Now, um, there's been dis discussions around, okay, 4G evolution to 5G. Um, you, you got some thoughts around um, 4G uh, LTE support for, for for V2X applications and how 5G changes enhances that that um, that V2X environment. Well, sir, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think the most important requirement to V2X is connectivity in general. Uh, we have to have some sort of connectivity, and the fact of the matter is, ultra wideband 5G is not going to be ubiquitous across our country, across the world, anytime soon. We will have it in major metropolitan area, which is great. And I look forward to seeing the applications that can be deployed with that type of functionality. But in the suburbs, in the rural areas, um, even in areas that uh, many of us go to say summer homes or cabins or, or things like that, 5G is not going to exist. And let me ask the, you know, a rhetorical question who here only drives their vehicle within their city limit? No one. <laughs> Everyone, you, the reason we have vehicles, the reason we all use our cars is so that we can go, we have the freedom to go where we want, when we want. And so if we're talking about autonomous vehicle, even if we're talking about connected vehicles, if we don't have ubiquitous communications across cities, across counties, across states, across countries, we're not going to be able to successfully run a true V2X um, ecosystem. And so I think with 4G LTE, what we can achieve is connectivity. With 5G, we can achieve more unique, specific applications around triangulation, around automation, and around um, you know, V to V and different types like that. But with 4G LTE, with what we have today, we need to be able to communicate with intersections worldwide. And if we can do that, then we have the foundation to truly start deploying V to X type applications. Good, good stuff. So obviously coverage is a, is a challenge, just availability of the technology. Now, um, it's not going to surprise you that I want to talk about a few other challenges. Uh, Will, particularly, I want to come to you on the question of device management. We've we've seen all sorts of issues with security, um, Jeep hacking, and all sorts of things like that. Um, and, and indeed, uh, everybody's doorbells going offline when Amazon had a or AWS rather had an outage. Um, how do we overcome some of those the, those issues? That question of device management and over the hour upgrades and so on must be um, a, a significant part of that, and that's your sweet spot. So I want to come to you on that. Thank you, thank you, Matt. And uh, Nathan rightfully pointed out connectivity is key, is important, but at the end of the day, is the device, the capability of device management. Why? There are two things, two sides to the coin of device management. One is being able to talk to the vehicle, right? What does it mean, talk to the vehicle? You do security patch updates, firmware updates for security reasons, for safety reasons, for compliance reasons, and all kinds, you know, uh, maintenance of the vehicle, uh, different systems in the car. There are over 300 or 400 some uh, electronic control units now in, in the newer cars. So they are from the cloud, to the vehicle and uh, the uh, firmware updates. Automotive folder, automotive firmware over the air means talk to the vehicle on the move. And also the vehicle talks back to the cloud, to the system, sending driving uh, information, location, uh, environmental uh, conditions, all of that. These are need to happen in real time. So these are key, the complexity is is uh, is is much 
multiplied now because of the uh, communication systems. Uh, we just mentioned talk about a Wi-Fi system versus the cellular system versus coverage uh, versus the range of coverage. The other complexity is just look at the car. We bought a car a, a few months ago. Just look at a car. I can't even drive it anymore without uh, first getting a bachelor's degree in what is car <laughs> because they've got so many different kinds of system driver train uh, control system, engine control system, uh, they, uh, even the dashboard, all of that, you know, all of these, they're kind of more complex. So yeah. device management takes care of updating these on the fly. Otherwise you can't go send your car back to the dealership doing, you know, a uh, very costly either recalls or uh, updates. Can you imagine millions of car coming back to the shop? to the uh, dealership or uh, somewhere for uh, updating uh, firmware or security uh, patches. That's just not a doable, uh, not conceivable anymore. But mm -hmm. security, on the other hand, is so critical uh, to, uh, to, driving, uh, to driving to uh, driving autonomously, uh, even automated, even the uh, driver-assisted uh, features to function, right? So, um, these are not only a cheap savings, it's also, uh, I think Z mentioned at the very beginning, uh, the point about a fatality. The entire premise of automated driving or autonomous driving is to increase safety, reduce fatality, reduce a uh, number of accidents. The place is the country, the system that adopt a unified platform, a technology, being able to enable these features are the places where they're going to drive down these fatalities, these accidents. So I can't wait for the day that uh, 5G is fully uh, prevalent. You know, don't be uh, pessimistic. Uh, we are even we started talking about 6G now. So the world seemed to be far away, but yet it was for us in the technology field, it, it, it is uh, it is uh, on the horizon. Or a lot of them are here and now already. Just around the corner, yeah. Um, one, one last question before I go to the questions that are coming in over the, over the Q&A. Um, and this one's also for Nathan. We've tended to focus on the, um, on the machine itself, on the, on the car. Um, Back-end infrastructure, uh, thoughts on how we connect that back-end infrastructure. I had a note in here to myself about public funding of vehicle-to-infrastructure. Is, is that how it works? What, what's the, um, what are the dynamics in there? Well, I think first and foremost, we have to eliminate the idea that wired communication to, in, to intersections is the only option or the best option even. Um, with what we were able to do in New York, we proved the use case that cellular technology, even 4G LTE, which is what we deployed, has the capability, has the reliability, has the scalability to be deployed in every single intersection in the United States and run every single application that exists in the V to X ecosystem today. Um, and so, and, and I think the, the best part of wireless beyond the connectivity piece that we've already talked about is the cost. It is mm. so unbelievably expensive and such a, a barrier to entry to run wired communications to places that don't have them. Um, just moving a, a wired connection from one side of the street to the other side of the street is an extreme exercise in futility, honestly it is. Um, <laughs> with cellular technology, with the capabilities that we have, we can deploy connectivity everywhere today and do it on a very, very low cost point. And because of the low cost point that exists with wireless deployments, the public funding piece, it, it really solves its own problem. Um, mm. No longer do we need billions of dollars to deploy communications infrastructures, even in major city with, with many, many different infrastructures intersections. 
we can deploy wireless communications to intersections, to assets, to all connected devices at a fraction of the cost of wired communication. And I believe that in itself will resolve the funding issue because uh, the, the funds will be able to be spread over vast, vast areas compared to concentrated areas uh, that, that exist today. Matt, okay. this is here. if I could interject one yeah. other comment yeah, to add to what Nathan just said, um, I, I, and also William, security is important. Our companies understand that. They're actually working in, in depth on that. Uh, we at Aeris were one of the founding members of an organization for security, which uh, got folded into the Geneva platform. I'll give them a plug. They're worrying about security for the automotive guys. So it's something that is first and foremost, on the minds of every OEM, so they're going to make it happen. Nathan's comment about V2I, I think, is well taken from the perspective of where we can deploy the, uh, the 4G LTE capabilities today to get information back from the remote city locations. It's that communication from the car to that infrastructure that doesn't exist today yet. It's that communication between the vehicle to vehicle that is, yes, totally capable with DSRC and potentially with, you know, obviously with CV2X, as well, but it hasn't happened on a large enough scale. So my concern about the cost in the public funding is not just the fact that it's going to cost a lot of money if we use 5G or we use CV2X or DSRC. It's also to the fact that the, the entities, the states, the local governments that are responsible for deploying this, certainly in the United States and nation states around the world, they don't have the will to do it because it's going to cost a lot of money and there's a chicken and egg problem that we need to deal with which comes first, the vehicle or the infrastructure or both. So it's gonna take time and that's my only concern. Again, I'm going to go back and be an optimist. It will happen, it's just a question of time. The some of the capabilities in V2X that we are uh, talking about today, uh, you know, for example, in the AV space are a little bit different, not connected automotive, but the AV space, for example, high resolution maps that need to be in the vehicle for the car to become a level four or you know, level five in time kind of uh, mobile device, frankly, that moves around inside dense urban areas and doesn't kill people or run over a bicyclist or hit an infrastructure that has changed because the map didn't update itself or there was construction work going on and now the car rams into a barrier. Those are the kinds of things that need to be solved. The corner cases are going to be killer problems and we need to be careful about that. Okay. If I may, if um, I may right. jump on this, Matt, uh, one, just to make a comment on what... Uh, Very what quickly so we can get some questions yes. off, the, um, off the audience. Absolutely. I, I think that there are several challenges in this uh, in this uh, in this landscape that need to be uh, solved before before having really um, the next step and to see the connectivity used widely, especially within the um, the autonomous vehicle. I, everybody has mentioned the availability and the penetration, the freshness of the information. So how is reliable the information, the trustability of the information related to the to the security also, and how how can we trust the information that we can get? from someone else actually precision precision of the position that uh, need to be highly mm -hmm. precise otherwise you inject errors into your system and finally safety do we need end-to-end -end safety system in order to be capable of using this kind of uh, information really in the automatic control of the vehicle mm -hmm. okay I, I, I've got a further question for you Stefania which is one that's coming on on the um, uh, from the audience um, uh, you guys deal a lot with positioning, so there's a question about satellites. I don't know whether this is one you'll be able to answer, but will LEO's deployments, low Earth orbit satellite deployments, OneWeb, Starlink, etc., solve the connectivity issues? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think that there are several ways to have a precise positioning, right? So, of course, uh, there is the uh, a positioning, a very precise positioning that uh, you um, need to have in order to uh, to get uh, reliable information, as I mentioned, uh, to, um, it, you know, the, the fact is that if you don't provide a very precise position to as an information to the entities into the system that you wanted to communicate with and you wanted to cooperate with, the big risk 
risk is that uh, you create a massive amount of errors actually and you bias the decision process in the autonomous vehicle in a, in a wrong way. So um, what we believe is that of course a high precision positioning and of course based on a GNSS type of solutions is uh, uh, needed for those kind of uh, solution of V2X uh, solution and the most we go into the shape of the autonomous vehicle the most we we move into the uh, into the uh, uh, landscape of the high precision positioning uh, system most probably it, it, someone mentioned also 5g and there are also several uh, activity that, activities that are ongoing uh, within the 5g in order to have uh, very high precision systems uh, thanks to the 5g uh, most probably in the future we will be we will see hybrid the type of solutions that will put together all the type all type of communications in order to have a reliable and seamless type of positioning whenever we are indoor, outdoor, in canyons, in the urban scenarios, and so on. Okay, good stuff. Um, let's move quickly on to the next question. Um, this one's for Nathan. Um, regarding vehicle to traffic infrastructure, what kind of contents are exchanged? Speed li limit information or more? Uh, yeah. So it, it, it depends on the area, it depends on the application. Uh, speed limit is definitely one. I think everyone is driven in a new car where the car is actually able to pull the, the speed limit from, from the sign as it passes it. Um, what we're seeing um, deploy more frequently nowadays are uh, things like TSP, um, transit signal priority or traffic signal priority is a big one. Um, um, traffic density monitoring and so being able to pull information about how many vehicles are in a specific intersection or on a specific corridor and then relay that information back to uh, the traffic management center and then be able to make informed decisions around uh, say moving EMS services from to to a specific area um, you know to to kind of just jump off of what William was talking about earlier uh, the device management and communication device exists today in a use case around transportation, public transportation with buses and around EMS with police and fire. So that's really where the start of it is at with, with buses, with police cars, with fire trucks, with ambulances. And as it continues to evolve, as we continue to be able to pull more information uh, specific to consumer type vehicles, the applications will expand from there. But really today it's focused on EMS, public transportation, and, and those large, large type vehicles. Okay, good stuff. Um, another question, Z, I'm gonna to come to you on this one. Could NBIOT play a role in V2X connectivity enabling wide coverage? Ah, uh, that's a darn good question. I think it's in a, in a sense it's slightly related to that Leo uh, question as well. Yes, NBIOT has a role. Now we need to be careful about this because V2X is such a large, all-encompassing term, ranging from a specific application like perhaps car theft recovery, where NBIOT can play a role, but it's not going to play a role in being able to download a high-resolution map. Right? It's just, it's just not going to happen. So the connectivity is critical. I think every one of the panelists have mentioned that the communications protocols that will exist are absolutely the key to what applications that are a subset of the term V2X um, can be deployed. So yes, car location, maybe in a car theft scenario or sending an information about a, a, um, a local uh, gas station if you're still driving an ICE car you know, a decade or two from now, those kinds of things NBIOT can solve. The, the LEO solutions, like all of the people who are out there, there are at least 10 LEO solutions for IOT that I'm aware of, uh, will help in coverage, will allow you to be able to get information when you're in that cabin out in the woods, as was mentioned earlier. But it's not going to solve the things that uh, AV or the high-end connectivity requirements rec need, uh, latency, lower latency. Uh, you need to have the ability to have rapid downloads for high-resolution maps to be able to allow even a level four vehicle to work properly. Um, and I'm concerned that people will start relying on these technologies as being commonplace. What's happening in urban environments 
5, 10, 15 years from now may never translate to a, a rural population um, decades from now. And the expectation that you can drive from your home to your cabin or wherever and back and expect the things to work exactly the way that the uh, mm -hmm. OEMs intended to, it's just not going to happen. So it's going to take some time and we need to be careful about that. Good stuff. And I'm going to squeeze in one final question, um, and that's to Will. Um, somebody asked a question, how do you deliver software updates when no connectivity is available to this big computer on, on the move? Um, thoughts on that in 30 seconds. Well, you really need a connectivity in order to execute your uh, your folder or your updates. So uh, the, uh, the communication network needs to exist. And uh, you have a choice, right? So you have different ways to do it. Uh, but in the end, at the end of the day, the data transfer, the data execution from the server in the cloud to the uh, device, to the uh, mechanism in the, in the vehicle, and the back and the forth, uh, that need, you do need a communication uh, uh, mechanism. And then you need to detect the state of the vehicle, right? Is the car, is the vehicle parked? Is it on the go? We're pretty much at time. Um, so I, I have to finally wrap up. I'd like to think, thank the IMC and our sponsors, Big View International, Core and Software AD for organizing this session. Please join us for the next panel discussion at the CES Partner Program for IoT Infrastructure entitled Low Power Wide Area IoT Technology Advantage. That panel is to start immediately at 1 p.m. And to access it, you simply click on the link provided at the end of this session on this platform. Thank you all very much. Thank you to my panelists. Good, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.